Jerry David Mulligan, and this is uh, Mulligan Stew on the CKUA Radio Network, uh, and also the Mulligan Stew Podcast. This is also the Mulligan Stew Podcast. And normally, I, uh, uh, my guests, I sometimes, many times, I'll actually s- explain what CKUA is and why we're talking to them, but I don't have to do that because David Miles is here. Miles from home, he hosted and produced on CKUA. Uh, so you you know about CKUA, yes? I certainly do. I love CKUA. Uh, how long were you with us? You know what? I think in total it was probably almost four years because it started before the pandemic. I did the late shift. They put me, I was on from what midnight to one o'clock at first, and then uh, and then eventually got the Monday noon slot. It was it was an amazing. I mean, I've had a connection to CKUA for a long time since I started making records. They were the first station to play my music. I like to, you know, it was Tom Coxworth brought the record in and David Ward chose it as CD of the week. And it, when you're starting out as a musician and you don't know if anybody likes your music except your mom, it is a very big deal to have. It was a huge thing for me to be CD of the week at CKUA. And so I, it was, I love CKUA and having the show was amazing. I mean, I really, I, I, I've, it was such an honor. It's a, such a unique station, and it's a community of people. That's the coolest thing. It's like, it's a relationship between all the DJs amongst themselves, and then the audience and the librarian. You know what I mean? It's this whole confluence of music lovers that come together. It's and, really special. And the volunteers. And of course, the volunteers. volunteers. The, the tons of volunteers. That's what I mean. It's so much more than just the station. It really is a community, and I felt like I was led into it. I was brought into it, and I felt really lucky to get to do the show. It was super fun. Then uh, why, pray tell, did you leave us? I just couldn't pull it off anymore, and I knew because I'm going out on the road. I'm doing more shows, obviously, as the you know, in the waning phase of the pandemic. Hopefully, there's more shows. I'm going on a national tour, and I was pre-taping the shows. It's a weekly show, and I just thought, there's no way. I just. I'm going to end up rushing this thing. And I don't really, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do like a, a half-assed job. You know, I wanted to go full on. That's what I've been doing. And I just couldn't keep it up. I could, it, it, it was, I've actually already started <laughs> missing it because <laughs> I loved it. But I just, once I started touring, I was like, I, I'm not gonna be able to keep up. I'm going to fall behind. I can't do this while I'm on the road. There was just too many shows going on. So it was the right move. I knew it right away, but. Um. And were you shown the door? Did you get to pack up with a box or no? You you weren't even in the building. <laughs> That's right. Not even in the building. It was all very congenial, very <laughs> Thank friendly. Thank you, Ms. Claus, for your services. Thank you so much. <laughs> Don't let the door hit you on the way. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they understood. They were super understanding. And I, you know, hopefully the audience is too. But again, I just felt like it, it was the right the right moment. I didn't want to start falling behind. I wanted to be able to commit to the station like everybody else who's doing shows is committing to the station. I didn't want to be cutting corners and doing that. So, uh, uh, David Miles is with me, uh, and we'll get to his new album uh, in just a moment. Um, I wanted to ask you about the podcast. Did you keep the podcast? I did keep the podcast. It's different from the community of CKUA. You still get to reach out. You still get to um, 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 engage and, and, and widen your footprint. Um, how, how are you going to get that? Will you do that on the road? Yeah, and it's less scheduled, right? It's less, I can kind of, pre- well, first of all, we kind of try to stick to a once every two weeks schedule, but it's not, if I don't do it for any reason, it's okay too. I'm kind of, I don't, there's not as many expectations on me. I do that to connect to artists and to have conversations that I think are meaningful about creativity, but it's a bit more on my own schedule. So, and it's every two weeks. So it becomes a little bit easier to, to stock up on them. I also felt like it was a current music show in terms of the, the, the show on CKUA. So I wanted to be able to check in with that new music list, which is so valuable. I couldn't just, I didn't want to do three months of shows because I wanted to be current when I was actually doing the music. So I can remember doing an interview with Lyle Lovett um, just before the, uh, the QP um, uh, Teamsters uh, put vacuum cleaners around us so we couldn't do the interview. They, they didn't like the fact that we were there in their theater. Uh, and I asked him, uh, we got uh, talking about radio and stuff, and he said, I did a radio program at the, the Texas University um, uh, interviewing all of the songwriters of the day in Texas, which is, there were a lot. 
and I did it because I wanted, that was my class. I wanted to learn how to write songs. And so I just talked to them every week and it turned out to be the best thing I ever did. So what did you, what did you learn from those four years that may help you down the road in terms of your music career? Man, it was super, super helpful. It's a great question because it really made me realize the importance of sonic environment. Yeah. It made me think about what is the environment that's being created by this artist beyond the song. I'm a song guy. I love a well-written song. But what I started to realize as I was listening to so much music is I started to look for what is a unique sonic environment what mood are they putting me in? What's, what is surrounding this song? Obviously, if I, what I'm talking about, I guess, is production, but I like to think about it as a little bit bigger than production because sometimes it's almost, you know, it's a production choice to have lack of production, but it puts you in a place. It wasn't about genre. It wasn't about tempo. It wasn't about even what language they were singing. It was whether I felt like I was immersed in a unique uh, sonic environment or emotional environment. That's what pulled me into songs. And when you're listening to so many current songs, which you've done your whole career, you start to recognize, well, what is it that's pulling me in here? And it's, it's, it's rarely consistent, except that idea that you feel like you have stepped into someone's universe. One of my, one of my common thoughts in, in the stew is that I grew up with all of these bands. I've interviewed them. I, I know many of the artists I'm playing, but it's not enough to just be a classic rock radio station or whatever that is, because um, that's been bastardized. But I want to know, I want to find the artists who are influenced by those bands and those artists and those songwriters, but they're making music today and finding that bridge and then putting them together. Yeah. You nice. know, you can, you can see the deadheads in today's music. You can see the, El, the Elton John, uh, the, the, the tons of Beatles uh, chords just still roaming around. Of course. Um, so that's what I try to do. I've tried to put the two of them together. Yeah, I love I love, and I love that. I love I mean obviously I'm a, I'm a record collector too and I I love hearing references. Uh and I just I love that I love just I I love something that feels like something new as well. Even if it has references, I like it stepping into something that feels like a unique environment. And so that taught me a lot. It made me more confident in my own records to seek uh doing something new, trying to trying to create my own environment, trying to create something that felt like me and not me doing someone else. Uh, to Beth out there who put us together, I, I promise to be talking about the album. Just give me a second. Because <laughs> these are the things I would have asked David uh, when he was at CKUA, and I didn't do it in those four years, and I'm kicking my ass. Um, uh, oh, I, like for example, I did a, last week, I, it was Hank Williams' birthday. And I said, okay, I'm not just going to play Hank Williams. So I played Hank Williams, and then I played um, uh, Roy Forbes. I'm so lonesome I could cry. Uh, what else? If I was like, shit, now I've talked myself into a corner. I have to figure it out. Oh, yeah. I did, um, oh, uh, Nora Jones, Cold Cold Heart. I did um, Bob Dylan, Can't Get You Off of My Mind, uh, which I thought was just great. Two classics right there. And I, um, I'm so lonesome I could cry, uh, Roy Forbes. Um, so you can find Hank anywhere in today's music, truly. Mm -hmm. There you could do tons of two-hour, three-hour, four-hour shows. So there's a lot, all you have to do is just challenge yourself to go find it. That's it. That's it. And there is so much out there. There's so much being made. It gave me a great sense of how healthy the Canadian music community is. How many good records and how also how important the role of a station like CKUA is that plays these artists that we know aren't getting played on other stations. Yeah. You know, they're making good records. I'm listening to some of these records and I'm going, man, this is a quality record. This is a great vision. These are good songs are well performed. And where are they being played? Well, they're being played on CKUA and they're being played by other community stations, but not that, you know, not in the commercial formats. And so it's it's really important for those artists to have a chance to get get shared because it's not like their music isn't accessible or interesting or really well made. And every week it was like that. I'd look on this new list and I'd be going, maybe I should, who are these folks? I'll listen to it and then I'll be like, are you kidding me? I'm in the Canadian music business and I'd, I've never heard of these people and they're making a record that sounds that good. I'm sure it happens to you all the time. It's all like- the time. All the time. Every week there's a surprise. And it was that was really refreshing. I kept on thinking I was gonna run out 
and I never did. So I've been more optimistic. I also realize how hard it is. I, I'm optimistic about the quality of music being made, but I also realize how it is a difficult time to be making a career in the music business because there's so few m parts of the music business that are monetized for those young artists that are making great records. Only a little lonesomeness, l only a little lonesomeness is the name of your latest album, if you had forgotten. And uh, and it dropped the 22nd, and this being the 23rd, the first interview you're going to be doing is with Mulligan Stewart, CK Way. Well done. I'm certain your marketing people planned this all out. Um, there's many times I do interviews about albums and I never talk about the title or the name where it came from, but this is, we were t talking about Hank Williams, I'm so lonesome I could cry. What is it about loneliness that draws you and why did it become the title? I felt like the title, it was interesting because it's actually the title of one of the instrumental songs on the record. It's called, It's Only a Little Loneliness. And with, with those instrumental songs, often I name them by truly just following my instinct and thinking about the first thing that comes to my mind. And that was the phrase. But to me, this was written mid pandemic, mid pandemic, like yeah. right in the heart of it. I made it in my house. My kids were upstairs sleeping. I was working at night, that whole thing. And there was something about that phrase that felt like it resonated with the entire project, which is when we are alone, especially when it starts to seep into being loneliness, yeah. it's easy to kind of tell yourself, it's only a little loneliness. Don't worry about it. You know what I mean? I'm only, it's, it's going to be okay. It's only a little loneliness. I can deal with this. But then you start to realize, and I think a lot of people did throughout the pandemic, we're social beings. We need each other. We live in community. We require contact. And so it was more that loneliness is actually a very serious thing. It's, it's not only a little loneliness. That's kind of what we tell ourselves to make it feel okay. But ultimately, it's quite a substantial part of what makes us human beings is how we connect with other people. And so that's where I felt like that record was made during the pandemic. It was made during this time where I went from really enjoying a solitary life, loving it, to running out and being like, I think I'm done with my solitary life. I want to see strangers on the street that I wave to. You know what I mean? I want to be part of the human community again, even if it's at a distance. I was thrilled to be a hermit, and then it just ran out. I was like, no more hermitude for me. Yeah, it, although some people ha have hung on to that hermitude uh, thing. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I like that. I like being in rooms with people. The first time they had a, a, a wine pour in Vancouver, people were looking at each other saying, is it okay if I hug you? You have to yeah. you have to go through those social distancing things. Um, uh, did did all did you write all of this during the pandemic? All of it. Okay, yeah, I wrote and recorded it all. It came it came right from that tall distance. I made the instrumental record, and was loving the process so much and loving this creative vibe that we had going that I just kept it going with this record and started writing songs with lyrics. I was going to play uh, one track just to get started to to uh, sort of test the waters. Yeah, and I was I picked make believe and then I realized it was a cover make believe. Yeah, it is. It's a it's a cover that I knew from Emmylou Harris, but tons of people sing it. And I've just always Emmylou Harris's version of this song is completely nuts. It's got an awesome key change in it. Yeah. And the harmonies are beautiful. And so I I've I've sung this song for a while and I was I don't ever I don't really record covers. I very rarely put a cover on a record, but I think I was loving this creative spirit with the band. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we did a cover and especially a classic country song. So let's try to let, so that's how it worked. That's how we did it. And Rose cousins, come on. I mean, she's the perfect duet yes. partner. You could have done harmony with yourself, but no, you went and got Rose. Cousins. <laughs> yeah, of course. Come on. If one can get Rose cousins, one gets Rose cousins. She is a heck of a singer. And there's two other instrumentals in there. Uh, continuing your, your love affair with instrumentals. Yeah. You know, I just, there was something about the pandemic, especially when it first started with that tall distance, that, that that was the instrumental record I made first. I loved the pure experimentation of it. I, I loved being in this situation where I wasn't asking myself too many questions. I was just following my instinct. I wasn't really, I wasn't going on tour anytime soon. It was the middle of the pandemic. I was thinking about what I wanted to make right then. And there was something also about expressing feelings that I was having that I hadn't quite put into words. I thought it was really interesting to explore instrumental music, which allowed me to explore feelings in a way that was different than had I just been writing out the words about how I was feeling on certain things. But it did, and, it did bring you a Juno. 
and it brought me a Juno. It was a wonderful experience. It, it, it made a really interesting record and one that I always would have dreamed to have made. You know, I grew up on instrumental music. And so in this project, I decided to keep a couple of them because I liked the air it created. I liked the space it created in the record. I liked that it, it allowed things to breathe and kind of show where I was at musically, sonically, emotionally. And it was, it, they, they, they came out great. Came, I'm really happy with the instrumentals. And Aaron Davis plays on one of them, who you probably know from the Holly Cole trio. Oh, yeah. So that was fun. Uh, what was the first single? First single was Mystery. Okay. I'm not yeah. really good on my following the singles, because uh, it's like okay. bait. I, wanna, I want the whole thing. I want to hear the whole thing. Yeah, excellent. I want to hear the single in relationship to the whole thing. That's good. Uh, why did you choose that, that, uh, that tune for the first one? Because it was a ripper? Kind of, I mean, there's hardly, you know, it, it's, I think it, it felt, it felt right. It felt right. It had a good vibe. I really liked that it was kind of a groove oriented tune. There was something that I was trying to create on this record and with the last one, which is where the drums played a fairly fundamental part. They weren't program drums by any stretch. It's Joss Van yeah. Tashel. He's an amazing drummer, but I was trying to leave space to get technical. I wasn't strumming through everything. I wasn't creating a lot of rhythm on the guitar. I was leaving a lot of room in the guitars so the drums could kind of lead the charge and the vocals, we could do a lot more with the arrangement. And so I would keep things quite wide open and then get the drum tracks and then start building around. And that felt, that tune just felt, it felt like a pop song in a good way. It felt catchy. I loved the vocals. I loved working with Rini and Haley Smith who I've worked with on, up for a while. and. It really, it came together as something really just, it, it felt fun. And there was, again, it, it related to the sonic environment that I'd been in with That Tall Distance, which was great. David Miles uh, is with me. This is uh, Mulligan Stew, CKUA Radio. And you're listening to the Mulligan Stew podcast. Only a little loneliness um, uh, is uh, upon us now and has been released. Um, I'm sh you, we'll do the tour dates in just a moment because one of them shows up close to me. October 13th, I think it is. Sydney, British Columbia, just outside of Victoria. That's the first day of the tour. A glorious little theater. And then you go back to face your former uh, audience, uh, still to be your audience, uh, when you when you play the Arden. And That's then you correct. go back to uh, Studio Bell. Uh, so the Arden's the 19th and Studio Bell is the 20th. The Studio Bell thing um, uh, is, is uh, it's a very special building uh, you record there, do you think? I, I mean, know. The, the Stones Mobile is in the building. I wondered that. So it's all, I haven't been, I remember when it was Cantos, like I remember the former National Music Center and I lived in Calgary for a while when I first started my career. Um, and I have not been in the new building. So I can't wait. I'm super, I'm excited to check it, it out. It's glorious. It's glorious. And, and he, they've got the crazy synth, right? They got the Stevie Wonder synth in there too, don't they? They got everything in there. Yeah. By the way, while we're at that point, they always ask um, uh, Canadian artists to donate something for display for future generations. What would you give today? What would you give them uh, as a remembrance of David Miles? Holy smokes. Um, you know what? I, don't, I mean, I don't know if it would be of any interest. I don't know if any of my stuff would be of any interest. So that would be the, the first thing. I, it was hard to believe. But I do have a couple of things that I kept out of just by chance and I remember keeping this bus ticket I took a bus from Calgary to Camrose nice and when I lived in Calgary I was going to play the merchant's coffee shop a little coffee shop up there for probably 10 to 15 people and on that bus ride I wrote when it comes my turn which I'm getting old but I'm not old yet it's a song that I've sung almost every single show since I've since I started since I wrote it you know it's been a huge part of my career it's it's helped me play all over the world and I kept that bus ticket I wrote that song on that bus and I kept that bus ticket and I still have the little lyric sheet where I was writing out the chorus so I guess it would probably be that because you know I always felt it strange yeah. Yes. that I left that bus and I kept that ticket because yes. I felt like I had something special had happened. Yeah. I, I never keep bus tickets, but something special had happened. And in fact, I was right from, in, you know, in terms of my career, it was a very special moment. And then you can't be accused by your relations of hoarding stuff. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I'm pretty good at that. I, I, yeah, no, for sure. 
that's pretty funny. Um, what's the uh, AC uh, uh, hard rock and roller? Is it? Um, uh, uh, is, uh, no, it's uh, you can't hurt me. Oh yeah, yes. Well, they, they, that, that, that captured me right away. Right on. You know, I actually, I kind of wish that was a single too. I love that tune. I love JJ oh, Kale. No. Like no, I no. absolutely that is, no, no. That's the single. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's such a, it was, that's it's the song we play every night. That's the other thing, right? Like I sometimes determine singles by what I want to play. What song, if I'm playing with a band and I'm showing a band a tune, what song am I going to play? That's going to be one of them because it feels everybody likes playing it. It's a jam. It's fun to play. But it's also for me, it was like, I always find it interesting to work in the kind of blues, you know, let's say periphery. Because it, it, so much has been done. So how do you switch it up just enough? We all know that the blues, like blues and rock is everywhere. The one, four, five change is so satisfying. Even when we don't know it's blues referenced, it still is often. And so it was one of those things where how do I do it where I don't feel like I'm just playing the blues or I'm, I'm trying to do a thing that's been done. And like J.J. Kale is a great example of that, right? Like a lot of those changes, if you listen to those tunes. Oh, yeah. There, it's essentially a blues song, but when you kind of break it down, you listen to how he's playing it, it feels a bit like country music. It feels like a bit like Southern rock. It's got these different things. And so that was, that was the challenge there was to kind of, and, and also some of the Stone stuff, right? Like, I mean, I just think about some of the funkier kind of, even like 70s style, like Miss You and stuff. Like that's such a kick-ass song. It's such a good song. Even if they never give credit for who they ripped off. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. But, you know, that was that was a fun one. It still is. You Can't Hurt Me as a song. Again, I've, I've been playing all the time with the band. I'm playing it with the – I'm doing a symphony show really soon with Symphony Nova Scotia, and we're playing – we got an arrangement done of that one. Tell me about the um, the, the string of, of thoughts, emotions, about mental health in this – album well you know the whole thing was a bit of a journey like the pandemic i think for everybody was a journey it was a real journey you know and the strange thing for me is that i started this journey pre-pandemic quite unwell i was really unwell I i'd been touring a ton i'd been away from my family a lot I was putting tons of pressure on myself. I was, I was, you know, like I, I think a lot of people, I had young kids and it just was kind of falling apart. I was starting to get like real health issues. Hmm. I thought, I, you know, like major stomach pain, facial hives, really wild stuff was taking place while I was on the road. And I was trying to get my job done, desperately trying to do what I felt like I was supposed to be doing, saying yes to everything, trying to make sure everybody was happy, try, saying yes going out, doing it, and it kind of just broke. I got really unwell on this one tour particularly and kind of went, "How? I don't know if I can do this to myself. I got kids, I got responsibilities. Where were you at the time? I, I was in Ontario. I went from kind of like, you know, right up to Northern. I played up in Kirkland Lake. I played in Ajax. I did two shows in a row, one in Kirkland Lake and one in Ajax. If you know Canadian geography, those are very far away. Yes from each other so it gives you a sense of what we were doing on the road that was kind of par for the course six seven eight hours in a van just the three of us you know it's never we got never got really to the level that we're like playing going on a tour bus or that we have how did, you work, bunch of people how did you work your way through it um I, I i did the shows you know like adrenaline does magical and crazy things you know but i actually did a show a couple of the shows with a giant facial hive like i looked it looked wild and I was kind of like felt like I couldn't possibly not do the show. I got through it. I just, I would do these shows and then at night it kind of just diminished and diminished to the point at the end where I actually thought I'm going to, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. Like, what am I doing to myself? Okay. okay so I, you and I, I, I'm sure you've used the same phrase. How I, I always say, can music heal? Uh, and the answer usually uh, almost, almost a hundred percent is yes, it can heal. But I didn't know about facial hives. Yeah, yeah, no, it did. It, I thought it maybe was, it was hearts or minds or souls. Hi, it was. It Dude. was a bleak. It was. It was. I don't know exactly what it was. There was a thyroid issue. There was stress. There was a lot of different issues. But I wasn't taking any time to to address it. And I guess the, I go back to that by saying when the break, when the pandemic happened, I actually was in desperate need of a recalibration of my priorities in my life. Okay, and so. 
I strangely enough, now to go back to music heals, I would say that in fact it does. Yes. In fact, I thought I was going to never play music again about four months before the pandemic hit. Then the pandemic hit and I wasn't playing live shows and I was taking care of my kids all day. My wife was working a regular job and then at night I'd sneak off and I'd have my couple hours by myself. What did I do in those two hours to make myself sane? I'd write music, I'd play music. I went right back to the core of what I love about creating music. It wasn't because of the audience. It wasn't because I needed to go on tour. It wasn't because I was trying to make sure that the managers were happy or the agents were happy or the, you know, the radio was gonna be happy. I was just doing it because I needed to do it. Yeah. So it was the weird, I like came right back to the core principle. I think it happened with a lot of people. We kind of reprioritized. It was like, well, what is most important to us? Now, you'll remember, I'm sure you'll remember because it had a profound effect on me. The first, the first two fundraisers during pandemic, we were, we were really reaching out and, and the music was really reaching out. We were picking tunes specifically for that time and place. And the feedback we were getting at CKUA personally and at the station all had the same theme. And that was, we need you in the room. Thank you for the voice. Thank you for the music. You are helping me survive these weeks, months, days, years. Thank you. It was so profound to, to see that come back. And, and yes, it was people talking between the songs, but it was also the music that carried the day. It was every, it was everything. It was the music, but it very much was people talking between because they're friends. It's, it's a community that we are part of and have it's and especially when we're dis distanced, we're not seeing that becomes your friend in the room. That becomes your outlet. That becomes your thing to relate to. We relate to one another. We relate to each other's feelings and to their feelings in art. And so when you don't have other people to relate to, when you're not just sitting at the bus stop and having a chat, you're relating with that song and going, oh, do I? Yeah, of course I relate to the lyrics of William Prince or, or whatever, whatever we're playing on the station at any particular time, uh, you know, it's, it, it can really, especially at that time, I mean, people's souls and hearts were tender. They were exposed, you know, and I felt like, I, I hear you, man. I, I absolutely hear you on that. Uh, I want to ask about one more song. No, I, I want to ask about all of them. Um, <laughs> I'm always drawn to the last uh, tr track on an album because it seems to be a, a personal statement by the maker of the album, the songwriter or the artist in, in, in particular. And it's called Solitaire. It kind of states a, a point of view. Uh, is it that final statement from David Miles? Well, I think it's interesting because, you know, a lot of the record is about solitude. But I think with that song, the reason I wanted to end it with it, because it felt meditative, but positive. It felt contemplative, oh. but optimistic. Yeah. And that was important to me. I wanted it again to have space. I meditate a lot. I love meditation. I loved experimentation with, with this idea of, of uh, space and rhythm. And I really wanted to try to explore that. It wasn't about big chord changes. It was about a meditative state that I wanted. And I, I remember finishing this thing and going, not finishing it, having it close and being like, I want a piano solo that goes for a really long time. And I know there's only one person I know who can do it. And it was Aaron Davis because he has such a specific way of playing between minor and major. He does these beautiful chords. He really does have a very unique way through chords in that you feel it is both optimistic and still blue. <laughs> it's a very special way to play. Oh, I and mean, what you did, because if I lost you, it's only a little loneliness. You can't hurt me making believe uh, a certain mystery. When you get to solitaire, what you're doing is saying, all right, I, these are all issues I want to deal with and, uh, and perhaps you can relate to, but the last track, I'm going to leave you with hope. That's it. It's open hope. It's not that I have all the answers. That's that is the that is the great mystery of life. <laughs> is that when you start to approach the mysteries of life, you realize that it's not about getting the answers. It's about embracing the mystery. And so part of that was about ending on a place where, yeah, the world is an open and mysterious place and I won't have the answers and I'm searching like everyone else. But I am hopeful.
So when you walk on that stage in Sydney, BC, October the 13th, will we be thinking, hmm, is he lonely? Is he hopeful? Is he, who are we going to get? I don't think so. I think you're going to know that I'm pretty stoked to be there. I'm going to be, <laughs> it's been a, you know, again, I needed that break. I am so grateful to be a musician. I am honestly so grateful to play. I'm excited to play for an audience. I'm excited to play with the two musicians I've played with for over a dozen years. I mean, I think it's going to be quite clear that at least I think the guys are too, but I am very excited. I'm going to be excited to play for people again on the Western side of the country. I'm, I mean, just to think that I, I feel like getting through this, getting past these couple of years and having fans that are still interested in what I do, if I, I got to be the most grateful guy in the world. That's amazing. Uh, you could have been laying rebar all these years. I, I could, and I'd be terrible at it. What, Dreadful. What did your family want you to do? They wanted me, well, all three of my brothers are doctors. Yeah, so yeah. there's two PhDs, two science PhDs, and a, and a medical doctor. So they were so either doctor or lawyer. They were super disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Until I got CD of the week, man, at CKUA. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm thrilled to see that you're uh, continuing, that your lips are continuing to play uh, trumpet, although it's flugelhorn on the album, right? I've been playing a lot of flugel. Oh, yeah, I, trumpet love flugel. I love flugelhorn. Man, I, it was a pandemic purchase. I bought it during the pandemic. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a trumpet player as well. Oh, that's right. And I love flugelhorn. I just love it. It's such a chill sound. I was so happy to actually get one on my own. And I've been using it a ton. I was just recording it yesterday. I spent the day playing the flugelhorn. Can I give you a name to uh, to zero in on? Oh, yeah. I would love, knowing your music and knowing his music, I would love for you to uh, see if you can find a common space with Daniel Lapp. Okay. Daniel Lapp, okay. who lives in Victoria. Okay. And may be at that show. He's just the most amazing uh, uh, artist. Great. L-A-P-P. -P. Have a look. Okay. Have Amazing. A I will. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, uh, we got the tour dates, October the 13th in Sydney, the uh, 19th in at the Arden, and the 20th at the uh, Studio Bell, and then onwards to fame and fortune. Um, and uh, you'll continue to do your podcast, uh, and you won't come back to radio. However, you are going to miss the fall fundraiser. I. You know so, what? I and so, with the remaining uh, minute that we have here, uh, perhaps you want to talk to your audience that you left behind, that you've walked out on, never mind, and, <laughs> and just leave them a message, if you would. I'll stand aside. Well, I guess most importantly, I want to thank the audience, everybody, the entire community at CKUA, the volunteers, all the people that work there, all the other DJs. And all the listeners, I think most importantly, for the opportunity to be on the radio and to share that time every week as music fans, as I always say, that's what makes that special, that station so special, this station so special, CKUA, is that it's about the love of music and how it can change the world and bring us together and do things that we can't even imagine possible. And CKUA is a station that really believes in that. And I'm so pleased. I, I might not have a weekly show anymore, but I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you. I'll be back. I hope they'll invite me back for some special programming every once in a while. And I'm, I'm, I'm here to help out in any way I can because it's been an absolute joy, honestly, to be, to be part of it. I loved it. And uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank you. I think you should uh, sit in for me on Mulligan Stew once in a while. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Stretch out a bit. Yeah, <laughs> right on. Find, find the dark you. Um, uh, congratulations on your um, album. I haven't seen the artwork. Have you got it anywhere oh. near you within reaching distance? No. Okay, fine. I do not. Are you on the front cover? Was that? Hardly, but I am. Okay. Uh, uh, by the way, that's one of the things I miss about vinyl was all of the information on the back of those covers. You don't I know everything that anymore. anymore. You just I find that it. really annoying. Because I'm a credit guy too. I spent. That's how I learned about music. Was reading liner notes. I want to know who was in there. Who who's that voice? Who's playing that lick? All those, all that stuff. I, I really. Yeah, I do try to make sure that I give everybody credit in other ways throughout social media, so people know eventually. And I do put on the CD, and we will do vinyl. But man, it's. Uh, I hear you with the digital. The digital stuff. You can't do it. It's brutal. The new album is out, friends. Go find it.
Uh, we'll be playing it. It'll be on the CKUA Top 30. Fingers crossed. Fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> David Miles. Uh, almost uh, almost a, a, a semi version of Miles from Home. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, check out the podcast. What's your website? My website is davidmiles.com, Miles with a Y. Did you return your front door key to a CKUA? I have. I never got one. <laughs> I was always at a distance. And and uh, I wrote you on your CKUA email uh, address today, but I, I, you didn't get the message. Oh, I'll have to check it. I will. I will. Um, have a great time. We'll see you on this end. I'll see you in Sydney. Great. Awesome. Thanks so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Great to chat. Thank you. David Miles, Mulligan Sue, CKUA. Now, let me hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on. Let me, let me stop that recording and let me pause this recording.